hybrid is always difficult, but I'm glad to be here in person. Uh, it's wonderful to talk to you, and hopefully we can discuss also after the, the seminar. Okay, so as, as Georg said, uh, I'm going to be talking about machine learning today, so hopefully the online audience can also hear me. Um, and what I'd like to show you today is basically <clears throat> first motivation for the smart data acquisition algorithm we have developed. Um, that's called the, the boss code, uh, which I'll introduce to you. And then I'll show you three examples of how we apply it in surface science uh, for confirm research and then for, for biomaterials. Okay, so as a, as a brief background, uh, a few years ago, we, we joined the NOMAD effort and, and started building the NOMAD repository. And then we also started looking into uh, data, data driven architectures, and did this perspective article on data driven material science. And <clears throat> briefly, what is it? So, traditionally, we, you do or we did research in three different ways either uh, through uh, experimentation, pen and paper science, or, or computation, all with the objective of you know, improving materials and finding new materials. Um, and we generated a lot of data in this way, right? And the premise of, of data-driven science is now to use this data or generate new data, and then couple this all with machine learning, and then again, discover or improve materials. And for this, you need infrastructure and you need databases and such. And we did a survey then uh, in 2019 and the years leading up to it and looked at what data infrastructures were available at, uh, at the time. And what you see here is a, is a world map with the, the dots representing different infrastructures and then a, a timeline at the, at the bottom where the, the darkest colors are the earliest infrastructures and the, the lighter colors are the, the later ones. And you see uh, really that it already started in, in the 60s with the crystal structure database and, and Calvert, and then there was a proliferation uh, in recent years. You also see that there's a clustering in certain parts of the world um, with maybe uh, Asia now uh, catching up. And then if we did the same survey now, there would be a lot more dots also in, in Asia, I would think. But then there's certain parts of the world that are, are quite absent, unfortunately, from this map. So if you integrate over the number, you see the, the evolution, the cumulative number of data infrastructures in material science in the world. And this is a nice exponential growth and one exponential that we maybe don't want to flatten. And what you also see is that there was sort of a, a turning point here, right at the inflection point is the materials project that is one of the most prominent uh, databases in our field. And that inspired, I think, a lot of um, data-driven research in material science. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in that article that I'm going to bore you with it now. I just want to present to you some analysis that we did on the current challenges that this, this field faces. And, <clears throat> and this then leads over to the motivation for my, for my talk. So obviously, in a database, you need relevant data, and you need it somewhat complete, right? But it also should be following some standards, and standardization is a problem in the field. The infrastructure needs to be accepted, right? Uh, needs to have some kind of credibility, and obviously you want longevity, right? With current funding climates, that can often be a problem. So what I like to focus on today is relevance and, and completeness. So one thing that we noticed when we uh, surveyed the data infrastructures was that the majority of data that is available and was available at the time is computational data. And this is very simple because it's already digital, right? So our computer code spit out a lot of data and we just had to basically reformat it slightly and, and then store it somewhere, right? Um, but what we're really lacking is an incentivization for um, recording computational data that is harder to generate. So we all know uh, when we do density functional theory, there's some calculations that are faster than, than others, and we have a lot more data on these faster calculations. And how do we get to more time-consuming calculations to, to put them in the database too? And what about experimental data, right? So either experimental data is not digitized, uh, or again, it's very time-consuming to produce. 
So I want to present to you one uh, uh, method that we came up with that incentivizes such data generation. And this leads me to the uh, BOSS code, the Bayesian optimization code that we have developed in, in my group. So briefly, what is it? Um, BOSS is short for Bayesian optimization structure search, but it's in general a global optimization code. It uses an active learning algorithm to explore um, the space that you wish to optimize. It's fully Python based, and you can download it now. Is it, uh, here's the URL, and it has a Apache 2 license if you want to use it. <clears throat> so, as a global optimization uh, tool, you need an optimization target, right? And this you have to define yourself, right? That's problem specific. So it can be maximum yield if you're doing synthesis or extraction. Now I'll come back to that. Lowest energy if you're doing DFT and structure search. High performance if you're developing devices. You name it, whatever you want to optimize for. And once defined, you start off with like a tiny little bit of data. This can be two points, three point, four points, right? And this comes from the function that you wish to uh, characterize and optimize. And then you basically build a machine learning model. We use Bayesian regression or Bayesian uh, a Gaussian process, and then we fit like this model to the available data. And the last thing that you need is some kind of policy for acquiring new data. This is often called an acquisition function or acquisition strategy, right? So this now is the decision that is being made by the algorithm to guide further data acquisition. And then you go to that point and you either do a computation there or an experiment there, whatever data you generate, we feedback and add it to your data set. And then you basically iterate this procedure, right? You go around this loop, acquire more and more data until you converge, which usually means you found the minimum, your, your optimum, uh, and, and you can stop. So what you get out of this, of course, is the optimum, right? That's what we set out to do. But then because we have a, a surrogate model, we also get other minima and they can be important. And I will show you examples of, of where we basically data mine a surrogate model for these other minima and, and why they're physically and chemically relevant. And in general, you get the whole landscape, which is a, a great advantage because then you can also get the barriers in between, which might be useful for describing activated processes. Um, so oftentimes in science, we wish to explore the entire landscape, and this tool is a tool that allows you to do that in the coordinates that you can handle, and this is a problem with the approach. And I haven't said anything about a scale. So this, of course, is scale invariant, so basically it works for the problem scale that, that you have at hand. It doesn't just work for atomistic problems, and I'll show you uh, two different length scale examples. Okay, so what's under the hood? Very briefly, um, we use a, a Gaussian process uh, for the surrogate model, and the Gaussian process is a distribution over functions, and this distribution is characterized by a mean and a covariance. Uh, I know if you don't know what a Gaussian process is, this explanation isn't going to help it. It's a complicated beast, but uh, one way you can imagine it is that if you don't have any prior information and we start with a non-informative prior, um, you can have any function in this interval between zero and one that is a possible function. And because you don't have any data, you don't know which one is the right one, right? And the gray gives you the uncertainty and that tells you basically you know nothing. But as soon as you have some uh, data that you measure, you limit the amount of functions that are actually possible. You still have to go through the data points. Right, and then you have a mean and a, and a variance basically that describe your process. So if this is a, a bit abstract, I'll show you a concrete example in a minute. <clears throat> um, so this whole thing uses a, a kernel basically to uh, to describe this process, and uh, we often use this radial basis function kernel uh, or an exponential squared exponential kernel. And you have two parameters in here: one is the basic variance or the signal strength. And then we also have a, a signal length scale, so that tells you how rapidly the function can vary. And, and these are actually learned on the fly. Um, and then in our strategy for acquiring new data points, um, we use what is called the exploratory lower uh, confidence bound, 
There are many other acquisition strategies. What they all usually have in common is that they balance two different things, right? So they balance what we call exploitation uh, against exploration. So exploitation would mean that you acquire more points to where you believe the global optimum is, right? So you want to find that better, right? But then you have to worry about the rest of parameter space. You don't want to miss an, an optimum, like a minimum hiding somewhere else. So you have to go explore and make sure that there isn't anything hiding elsewhere. And that's the exploration part that you have to balance against. And the way we are doing this <clears throat> is by, by using this uh, form for the acquisition function uh, where access the data and then the posterior mean. Uh, if we only min and when we minimize A, we only minimize the mean, we would do exploitation, we would go to where the minimum and the function is. Then we subtract from that the square the variance. And if we only had the last term because it's negative, we would only go where the uncertainty is highest, we would try and minimize that. By bringing the two together, um, we, we balance the two, and this factor that controls the, the strength depends on the number of dimensions we have, and basically where we are in the search. The, the longer we search, the more we favor exploration. Okay, this was uh, <clears throat> basically all I wanted to say about the techn technicalities. Let me show you a practical example how this works in one dimension. So here we have a, a function. It's actually an angular coordinate uh, in black. So this is the pre-computed function, right? And then we have three data points now that we give to the machine. It fits the Gaussian process to it. And the blue is the, is the mean. So that's the current model. And then gray is the uncertainty. So what you can see is the blue and the black, they don't agree very well, right? So the model isn't very good yet. And it tells you that by giving, it, giving you a lot of uncertainty, right? And the predicted minimum also is very good. So now the acquisition function basically says, okay, go here, give me a data point there, which we do. And that was the region of very high uncertainty, right? So they, they wanted to minimize uncertainty. So it goes here and immediately the function does look a lot better, right? But we're still not at the right uh, minimum. So the next acquisition comes close to the minimum, right? So that's now our fifth data point. And now with five data points, we already described the function fairly well. And where we haven't yet acquired any data on the left, we still have some higher uncertainty, right? And then a few more acquisitions, so nine points in total, basically describes the whole function very well. And what you can see is that both strategically samples in, in points where there's a lot of variation, right? So at these uh, slopes here, or um, basically where the turning points are. Right? And that's sort of good strategic sampling. Okay, so equipped now with this technology, um, we move on to the first example, material science example I wanted to show you. So um, here, uh, here's the team. Basically, the effort was led by, by Milica Todorovic, who's now a professor in Turku, Yari's student, on a postdoc. And then we teamed up with the uh, AFM STM group of Peter Lilliro set out to the student Ben Aldred uh, did the measurements. So what they set out to do is they wanted with AFM to, uh, to measure a bulky molecule. You all know very well that it, uh, AFM, when it's CO functionalized, was very good for plant molecules. And they wanted to look at this bulky camphor molecule on the copper one more month surface. So they did the uh, measurements and here they are. So for example, images, and you can see that you don't see very much. So this beautiful atomic resolution the atomic resolution we get for flat molecules just isn't there for this bulky one. And uh, yeah, they had pretty much given up at that point. Um, but then what's the solution? Well, you do some BFT calculations where you have atomistic models and you try and mix and match, right? You try and match this to, to the uh, experimental images. The problem with that is that I mentioned at the beginning, right, these are maybe not super large systems, but fairly large systems, about 200 atoms. And then each DFT calculation is not super costly, but costly enough that you don't want to do too many of them, right? And if you do a full structure search, you all know you need to explore a lot of configurations. So it all adds up and you, you spend a lot of computing time. So this is one of those examples where you have uh, costly acquisitions. 
And then the idea is to use smart sampling strategies to cut down on the number of total calculations that you have to perform. So what we did is uh, we needed to break down the number of degrees of freedom. So we defined uh, two building blocks. We said we have the molecule, we have the surface. Both of them aren't allowed to, for now, uh, relax structurally. And then we just move the molecule uh, in its six degrees of freedom. So three rotations and three translations. And that's our search space relative to the copper surface. And then all the EFT calculations that we perform for the energies uh, are done with the HI aims and the PBE plus Van der Waals uh, functional. So here I'm showing you now basically how, how BOSS works. So on the left, what you see are basically all the acquisitions. So BOSS tells you uh, where it wants energy points returned. And on the right, you see the current belief in the, in the global minimum. So this is a structure that converges relatively quickly and then only changes uh, in, in small increments. And you can see, or you saw on the left, that the sampling is really sort of all over the place. So we really explore um, the, the possible parameter space in six dimensions. So what we then get is a, a six dimensional uh, potential energy surface for this process. And this is then analytically available in the sculpture process. And we can basically just data mine it and pull out the minima. And that's what we did. So we got all the minima on this potential energy surface. And then in each minimum, we launched a geometry optimization. Prior, we had only done single point calculations. And what we ended up with then was eight different stable structures. So here I'm showing you five energy ordered, right? And these five are all similar in the sense that they're chemi absorbed, right? There's an oxygen atom. The oxygen atom is pointing to the surface and it's interacting with the, the copper. And then we found uh, three other geometries where the oxygen atom is now pointing up, right? And there's some kind of some hydrogen atoms pointing at the at the copper surface. So these are one of those pointed structures, and they're lower in, in energy, so they're they're less stable on on the surface. So we found these eight different uh, conformers, if you wish, of of comfort on copper. So now we have basically our EFT answer to the problem. We have our atomistic models. And the next step then is to match them to uh, the experimental images. Um, <clears throat> briefly, you may wonder how good was this approximation of keeping the, the molecule and the copper surface rigid, right? So what I'm showing you here are these gate conformers. And always in blue, you see the, the energy that comes directly out of the 60 potential energy surface. Then in, in yellow, uh, sorry, in orange, you see basically the EFT energy at that point. And those two should be very similar, right? Because they tell you how well the model is fitting the EFT energies. So they are very similar, that's good. And then in gray, you see uh, basically the relaxed structures uh, for the same starting coordinates. And that basically tells you how much the system adapts to the release of all degrees of freedom. And the change there is relatively small, it's between 0.1 and 0.2 EV. So this building block approximation uh, in this case works very well. I'm well aware that there are many other cases where this doesn't work, but in this particular case, it worked. So it allowed us to first coarse grain and then fine grain um, uh, as a strategy. Okay, um, briefly about the efficiency. No, normally, before machine learning, you would have done this with conventional structure search using intuition. Um, so you may have picked four different sites and different molecular orientations, and then you would have spawned uh, geometry relaxation. Say it takes 40 steps to relax your structures, you would have taken, it would have taken you about 1,600 EFT calculations. And with BOSS, we had uh, about 900. So overall, we saved about 40% of computation time. This estimate hinges a lot on how much you would have tried in your conventional approach, but this is sort of the minimum that you probably should have tried. The other thing is that we took human bias out of the search, right? And I'm showing you here the uh, final positions um, that the center of the molecule assumes. Right, and then the, some of them agree, so that the top side shows up, and then there's some that are reasonably close to the FCC side. 
right? Uh, but there are a lot of other positions that, that you would have missed had you only focused on these high symmetry ones. So there is great benefit to human intuition, but there's also great danger only relying on it. So it was good to take the human bias out. We had some other examples on a copper oxide surface where actually the human would have missed some structures that the machine found. Um, so how did we do the comparison to experiments? We used uh, an AFM simulator, this uh, probe particle module developed by Propo uh, Hakala. So basically from our structures, we simulate AFM image stacks, right, uh, with a, a CO tip at, at different heights. And then we compare those to the experimentally measured um, image stacks. And then basically we, we feature matched, right? We identified salient features in the images and then uh, characterized them and, and compared them to these between theory and experiment. And then that way we were able to assign uh, <coughs> more or less equivocally um, uh, atomic structures to the AFM images. So in that way we were identify, we were able to identify three different um, stable. Uh, conformers of this molecule on the surface and have the atomic geometries for it. Um, okay, so for the first time, I would say we were able to image a bulky molecule with atomic resolution by combining really experiment, DFT simulations, machine learning, and uh, AFM simulations. Um, so I alluded to conformers already, so I want to briefly show you some conformer search that we've done um, for uh, a, a normal molecule <clears throat> without the surface. So this was work done by Balin Sun and, and she, and then also Manuel Buchelmeister, who did some uh, advanced bio on this. Um, so we picked the, the cysteine molecule, <clears throat> it's an amino acid, and it's often used in functionalizing uh, nanostructures. And we picked it because it has a, a sulfur group and that bonds easily to, to gold, for example, if you have a, a gold cluster you wish to functionalize. And this has been studied before, so there's experimental as well as theoretical reference data available for this problem. And we use very much the same methodology. We first coarse grained uh, the search into quadrahedral angles. And then <clears throat> we had the boss basically build a surrogate model in this 4D space, suggest so new uh, coordinates. We would do a DFT calculation at those to turn the point and then built up this, this uh, potential energy surface. Then we data mine it for the minima, do structure relaxation, and then we add entropy and couple cluster corrections, or we do uh, MP, MP2, MP4 calculations or comparison. So our search space, as I said, uh, five dihedral angles, so it's 5.4. Uh, so they're shown here, basically, and they are actually what determines the, the conformers and not the individual one length or so. Um, and then again, we use AIMS as its calculator again. Uh, here they are, right? So these are all the conformers that, uh, that we found. I know it's very hard to grasp. So let me point you to the color coding. Uh, so red are also conformers that were found in experiment. <clears throat> Black are conformers that were predicted with previous conformers search. And then blue are conformers that we found that weren't documented in the literature. So we found uh, about nine new ones, and uh, there, there are plenty more. I mean, these molecules have a lot of conformers. Um, briefly, when you, when you do such work, you always show the, the hierarchies, right? So basically, here are all the conformers we observed as a function of the energy or energy ordered. <clears throat> and, and not surprisingly, in this case, we find much larger changes when we switch on the DFT relaxation. Right, um, so the basically the conformal hierarchy reorders. That's fine, uh, and then we also performed MP4 calculations and then it reorders again. So even DFT isn't isn't perfect here. And I'll come back to this point in a, in a minute. Uh, we did the MP4 because there was MP4 reference data available in the um, citation at the at the bottom. Very unfortunately, at the time, people did not use data infrastructures and they didn't even publish their XYZ coordinate files. So all we have are pictures of the molecules, the conformers, and energies, right? And the weird nomenclature. 
So it's very hard to do the comparison if you don't have X, Y, Z coordinates. So if you're thinking of doing similar work in the future, please put your structures on no man or if you can't put them in the paper. So we can only assume what the structures were, but our <clears throat> energies compare very favorably to their energies. So we're fairly confident that we found the same conformers that, that they found. Um, so here it was harder to assess the efficiency, but we went back to a, a paper by Volker Bloom and that he did at the Fitzhaber a few years ago, where they looked at various uh, uh, organic molecules and, and did structure search with a genetic algorithm. And we all know a genetic algorithm is, is fairly data hungry. And they needed between 20 and, and 60,000 60, single point DFT calculations for molecules with a similar complexity, four to six uh, degrees of freedom. And what we spent on these five degrees of freedom were first 1,500 single point calculations to parameterize the model. And this is really the key. We use single point calculations. We don't do the relaxation until the very end. So once we've coarse grained, once we found the basins, the funnels, right, then we do the structure relaxation for about 50 conformers. And, and that's where most of our DFT calculations go, right? So altogether, we have uh, about 3,000 or the equivalent of 3,500 single point calculations. So we are about a factor of 10 more efficient than the genetic algorithm. So that's quite a huge improvement. Um, and, and running the boss algorithm really is difficult. Um, but, so we can do conformer search uh, also for, for molecules with uh, sort of a moderate number of degrees of freedom. Um, so we did this with DFT, <clears throat> but we saw that there were actually differences to MP4. So can we actually build a potential energy surface directly with the higher order methods, right? MP4, copper cluster, where now, again, coming back to this incentivization of expensive calculations, can we collect data for very expensive calculations? And does that make sense? <clears throat> so for this, we actually do uh, multitask learning, uh, we called it delta learning earlier today, transfer learning, multi-fidelity learning uh, are, are terms that are also common. So we divide into two different tasks. So in tasks are different information sources. This would be DFT and copper cluster. And then we say DFT has a low fidelity, copper cluster has a high fidelity. And now we build a joint Gaussian process with, with different inputs. And the keyword here is this intrinsic core reorganization model. Again, technical details aside, the way it works in practice, you can do transfer learning. So where you have a bunch of, say, DFT data, low fidelity data, you build a low fidelity model, this you correlate with a high fidelity model, and then you only acquire high fidelity data, right? And you assume there was already enough information in the DFT, say, potential energy surface, that you only need very few couple cluster points, expensive points, to then learn the difference, basically. You can do this more dynamically by not making any prior assumptions. You let basically the algorithm decide when you have this joint model, do you want to add more data that is cheap uh, or do you want to add more data that is expensive but maybe more informative? So you need a, what is called a cost-aware acquisition function. We did a lot of research into this uh, and it turns out you can do it. I'm only gonna show you results on the transfer learning for, for reasons of time. So we, we tried two different, uh, three, three different fidelities. We had force fields that are very fast to evaluate, but not very accurate. We had DFT uh, that is about 15 times slower than force field. And then we had this high accuracy copper cluster, which is 7,000 times slower than a force field. <clears throat> and uh, they're still fairly well correlated here. Uh, as you can see by these peers and correlation coefficients, and that's important for the learning. So then uh, basically what we now look at in transfer learning is how much initial data uh, do we throw at the problem, and then how many iterations do we need of the expensive method to converge. And then on the left, you see this for force fields to DFT learning where um, you always have the number of your iterations on the left and the time on the right. 
And you see uh, that the more low fidelity data you throw at the problem, the fewer acquisitions you need, the more expensive method. And this is uh, the same trend if you start uh, going from DFT to public cost. So how much do we save? Uh, in four dimensions, we can save up to 75%, right? So this means that you can do, with the effort of 25% of couple cluster calculations, you get the, the full potential energy surface that you would need um, <clears throat> otherwise if you only get a couple cluster available. So 75% is quite a dramatic um, time difference or effort difference. Um, so now you can fairly efficiently directly get uh, high accuracy, high fidelity potential energy services for these systems. Whenever you end out that your DFT function wasn't good enough, and then you have a higher order method available, I think this is now moved into the realm of the doable. And I think Pierre's um, parameterization of force fields follows a similar strategy. Okay, so we have them, and, and the multi fidelity learning actually gives similar savings of 62, uh, 70%. Okay, uh, I have time for the, the last example. <clears throat> so now I want to move on to experimental data. Um, this is different data from what you deal with on a daily basis, um, but hopefully uh, it's, it's transferable in concept. So Finland has a lot of trees, and so there's a lot of biomaterial available. And at Alto now, there's a, a flagship called the Pinceres Biomaterials Flagship, and their objective is to really uh, redefine the way in which you uh, think of these biomaterials and, and give you know, classical wood and, and cellulose lignin type materials a new, a new purpose. One objective in this, so this is a fairly, <clears throat> well, pulp and paper is a fairly traditional industry. <clears throat> and this is a, a part of chemistry where there isn't a lot of digitalization and, and machine learning happening at the moment. And this was one of the motivations for, for going in and, and doing joint work together. Um, so what we focused on was not cellulose, which is probably more common and more known to you. We focused on, on lignin. And here you can see one structural model. There are many, many for lignin. Uh, and it's actually not, not really clear what form this, this biopolymer polymer assumes. But it is very abundant, right? So lignin is what gives um, plants, trees, flowers, so mechanical strength, right? It's found in the cell walls uh, in, of plants. And it makes up quite a lot of the biomass between 15 and 40%, right? And right now in the pulp and paper industry, it's, it's actually thrown away. It's either burned off or put on a landfill. It's not used. Right, so that's a lot of biomass that is underutilized. And the idea then is to, you know, find ways and processing ways of, of making or turning lignin into, into value-added products. You can think carbon fibers, you can think thermoplastics, uh, you can think um, <clears throat> uh, surface coatings that have certain properties, making them into so nano, nano objects. And then antimicrobial, for example, this is sorts of good stuff. Um, so the idea was then to, to start at the very beginning uh, how we extract uh, lignin from uh, wood. And this is a very time consuming process, and we wanted to optimize that with loss. Right. Uh, so for this, we teamed up with Michel Balakshi, who had invented a, invented a new method of uh, basically cooking lignin out of, out of wood. Um, so the way it works is you grind up, say, a birch wood, and you put wood chips into a reactor, add water to it, and then you basically cook it, right? So you apply heat over a certain amount of time, and uh, what falls out or what you get is the hydrolysis that you don't use, and then a solid that falls out. And then to this solid, you apply acetone and that pulls the lignin out. So you get acetone extracted lignin, you measure the yield for it, and then you send it through to the NMR to, to characterize it. And <clears throat> this process, although simple looking, is fairly time consuming. So this can, can take days to uh, 
uh, process while you can process in batches. So you can work on, on several samples uh, at the same time. And that helps a little bit with cutting down the time. Okay, so what we then did is we defined a design space of so two parameters that were most important to the uh, chemist. One was temperature of the reaction and then what they call a P factor, which is essentially the integration over the temperature profile in the reactor. And that's a measure for the reaction severity. Um, there are others like the liquid to solid ratio and, and <clears throat> depending on the reactor, you have more, uh, which we didn't consider in this uh, initial study. And then we defined two objectives. One was the total yield, which we wanted to maximize. And then we picked one of the many that had about 50 NMR signals that are characteristic for different parts of the polymer. One that is very important is this beta of four uh, linkage part that so tells you basically how much the, the polymer branches and that support for further processing. So we wanted to maximize that also and, uh, with view for further um, functionalization of the polymer. So these were our two design objectives. <clears throat> and then BOSS would basically now work iteratively. So we, whenever we uh, suggest new processing conditions, actually somebody uh, goes to the lab and prepares a sample at those conditions. They, they characterize it and feed the data back to us. BOSS does its work, sends the experimentalist to the lab again. So this is AI guided uh, data acquisition. Good. <clears throat> so we start off with five points in this design space, um, and then you get for the yield a fairly poor model. It's basically only giving you signal at, at the data points, and otherwise it's sort of averaging through. <clears throat> and what it then suggests is basically four points. So we're acquiring separately here from the yield and the beta of four map. And uh, this is where the model wants you to go, the green points, and then we can analyze this. So we get exploitation, right? So where the, the model thinks the maximum might be, it wants more data. And then this is where the beta of four turns out to be high, so it wants more data there. And then we get two exploration points, right? So it's very uncertain near the, near the boundaries. Uh, and you can see this in the uncertainty map, actually, which is very high, red is very high. So in regions of high uncertainty uh, of the yield map, and then also for the beta of four men, you get uh, acquisition points. So they prepared the samples, characterized them, gave us the data points back, we created a new model. So this is the example of batch acquisitions, right? <clears throat> Four data points at a time. So already with now nine data points, the model looks a lot better, right? So we lost the delta functions and we have a, a smooth behavior now. <clears throat> and if you look at the uncertainty map, we also minimize greatly the, the uncertainty, right? There's still regions of high uncertainty that you can tell boss wants to go there next to minimize it, right? And then here you get, I think, uh, exploitation because the yield was high. Okay, so then we acquire and acquire, the map gets better and better, and this is batch two, batch three. Uh, to Let me go back. So batch three is already looking very good. And then we wondered, um, <clears throat> are we good enough? So we basically then compared the, the model uh, to the actual prediction, so the model to the actual data points. So this would be the training set comparison, which looks very good. So measured as red and blue are predictions, but this doesn't tell you all that much. So then we compared to a so-called test set, the experimentalist hadn't quite trusted us, and they had done some measurements on their own just to make sure. And that data was actually great to have because that wasn't used for model building. So we could then test our model, make predictions for those points, and then see um, how good it turned out. And it turns out that um, within the error bar, basically, of the, the measured data points, so we knew we could basically stop here and had enough points for the, the fitting. So in the end, you end up with very intuitive maps. So here's the one for the yield you've seen before. Here's the one for the beta or for um, the points in the same positions. Um, and you can see that we fulfilled our objectives. We maximized both the yield and um, the beta or four um, with very few acquisition points. 
unfortunately, these are antagonistic properties, right? So where the yield is high, the beta of four is low, and vice versa. So that's that's not so good. So we can pull out now that we've done the full study, we can pull out the two uh, <clears throat> maxima no problem. But this is a classic case for multi target uh, optimization, right? So you have two different targets. Now you know they're in different places, you have to find a compromise. Since we have analytic surfaces for this, now that we fitted them, we can then do basically a Pareto front analysis. So we look for basically the optimal points um, <clears throat> for, for both. Right, so and then and blue are all possible combinations, and then black are basically the Pareto optimal points. Because if you would go away from the black line, one of the two properties would get worse. Right, and this black line is now your your guidance. Right, so here you can read up. If you now want a certain beta of four content, say twenty, right, then you can read off the yield will be uh, close to sixty. Right. If you want maximum yields, you go to 100, then you get a beta of four of seven. Right. Uh, so now you can basically make your design choice. This is what this type of polymer I want to have. And then you map this back to the to the design space. So each black point here corresponds to the black points in the previous slide. You identify the correct one, and then you have your processing conditions uh, to which you have to set your reactor to get that type of treatment. Right. <clears throat> So once we've done our boss runs, this multi multi target optimization it is actually very, very simple. We are now working a little bit on, on building this multi target directly into the boss search, which you can also do with, you know, basically trying to map out the Pareto front instead of the full landscape. Um, right. So to conclude this part, so we successfully applied this to experimental data. We digitized, if you want to create an experimental data set in a guided fashion. Uh, this turned out to be fairly efficient. We're now applying this to 3D, 4D spaces to see if it's still that efficient. And uh, we, we managed to reach our target of, of optimizing extraction yields. As a side note, we have a new project now where we are working directly on surface catalysis. So we want to optimize this reaction, CO2 plus three hydrogens. <clears throat> so we first want to optimize basically the settings of a microreactor and then go out and look for a new catalyst and then every time optimize the processing conditions with this framework. Um, this is still in the making, I think they now purchased all that. This is the big reactor where they can't change the catalyst very easily, uh, but now they purchased the micro-reactor parts so that we can do this more um, closer to high throughput. Okay, so in summary, I think I've used up my time. Uh, I showed to you how the BOSS code works. So BOSS is basically a robust build from GPI of Bayesian optimization. Uh, has easy input files, uh, restart capabilities, very good post-processing, um, simple, simple Python interface you can use on the command line, you can use it from a no uh, notebook. It has a, has a good API. You have different finance acquisition functions available, different choices of priors, this automated minimal extraction. The multi-fidelity learning is in a separate branch, but you can also make that available. It will be integrated soon into the full version. <clears throat> um, here's the link again. Right, so this is the BOSS uh, developer team um, between sort of six and 10 people simultaneously working on, on different features. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for your attention today.